So we're going to talk about uh, an update, in, in a sense, to uh, Epictetus in particular, and, and kind of Stoicism uh, more, more generally. Uh, it's an update that I propose in a book that just literally came out like a, couple, a couple of days ago. It's called The Field Guide to a Happy Life. And um, um, it is, as I will try to argue, a, uh, something that I think we need, to, need to, to do and we need to think about it. That doesn't mean that the way I'm proposing it is the way to do it. But it's also something that has actually been done from the beginning of Stoicism. Stoicism is, in fact, has always been a uh, living, dynamic uh, philosophy of life. Uh, there we go. So the obvious questions that one might ask if I, if I tell you, hey, I wrote a book that, that kind of updates the Enchiridion because the book is divided in 53, 53 sections uh, and each section mirrors directly uh, the 53 sections of the, Enchi the original Enchiridion. So I covered these exact same topics as Epictetus. So the two obvious questions here are why and who the hell are you to update Epictetus? So let me try to answer both questions. First of all, does Epictetus or Stoicism more in general uh, need, a, need an update? Well, I mean that every philosophy or religion evolves uh, through time. Um, religions, I think of religions as a type of philosophy of life and they also evolve uh, sometimes in a more recalcitrant way than philosophies of life because they're kind of, you know, the writings of Jesus, the, the, the sayings of Jesus are supposed to be the, the word of God, literally. So you don't really, you, you want to be careful about updating God. But nevertheless, um, you know, Christianity as it is presented today, it certainly is not the Christianity that existed 2000 years ago or a thousand years ago. And the same, of course, is, called, is true for philosophies. Stoicism itself evolved during a, a, a number of periods of uh, scholars, uh, referred often to the early stories, to, to early middle and late Stoa for the first five centuries or so of the history of, of Stoicism. And if you look at what was happening at the time, for instance, if you look at Diogenes Laertius' accounts of the lives and opinions of the eminent philosophers, you'll see that there were disagreements. Cleantus, the second hand of the Stoa, disagreed with Zeno. Uh, and Chrysippus disagreed with both. And then there was Aristos who went in another direction. Dion Dionysus the renegade, and the name, the nickname there tells you something. You know, he clearly took positions that were very unorthodox within Stoicism. Posidonius, one of, one of the middle Stoics, also uh, disagreed with Chrysippus or Cleantus. So these things have been going on from the beginning of Stoicism, and rightly so. Uh, because, as I said, Stoicism is not supposed to be a, uh, something written in, in, in stone. The philosophy also evolved in response to external pressures, for instance, in particular by, from, from the Epicureans and the academic skeptics. Seneca is well known for having borrowed things from, uh, from Epicurus. He, he says several times in the letters to Lucilius, you know, here, let me give you another gem from Epicurus. And it's, in fact, he, he says it so, so many times that at some point uh, Lucilius must have said, you know, what the hell are you doing here? And uh, Seneca's response is, well, I wander into enemy's camp, not as a traitor, but as a scout, right? And, and he says, if there is truth somewhere to be had, I'll, I'll help myself to that truth, because um, that is, uh, that's, that's the rational thing to do. And John Sellers uh, has an entire chapter in uh, The Art of Living, where he details the back and forth between skepticism, academic skepticism and Epicureanism, and, um, uh, and how the two schools informed each other. And here is Seneca himself, who in one of the letters to Lucilius, letter 33, says, uh, will I not walk in the footsteps of my predecessors? I will indeed use the ancient road, but if I find another route that is more direct and has fewer ups and downs, I will stake out that one. Those who advance these doctrines before us are not our masters, but our guides. The truth lies open to all. It has not yet been taken over. Much is left also for those yet to come. So, so we, we find this straight into the early Stoicism, the original Stoicism, that not only people disagreed and changed their mind about things, but actually Seneca says, look, the people that, are, that came before us, which of course for, for us in the 20th century includes both Epictetus and Seneca and, and of course Marcus Aurelius, well, those are our guides, but not our masters. If we find other ways or if we need to change things, then, then we will do it. Now, the second question that I was asking to myself, in a sense, is now, well, isn't that a little bit pretentious? Uh, you know, who the hell are you to update Epictetus, essentially? And, you know, perhaps I am. Uh, it is pretentious, but I think I'm in good company. 
Specifically, the Enchiridion had been updated several times already, four times at least during the Middle Ages and the early Renaissance and the early modern period. Um, it was used to, uh, to train Christian monks with a few changes here and there, but some updates or modifications were done in the 10th century, 11th century, 14th century, 17th century. And as recently as 1995, Sharon LaBelle actually produced her own version of sort of a co her own commentary and, uh, um, of, of the Enchiridion. If we go from uh, Epictetus specifically to Stoicism more generally, then there's been a number again of attempts to update the entire system. One of the most famous was Justus Lipsius, so-called Neo-Stoicism uh, during the Renaissance. And uh, more recently, Larry Baker's uh, um, book, A New Stoicism, among others. These are not the only ones. So, but let's talk about Epictetus specifically, of course, and, and about the Enchiridion. The two images that you're looking at uh, at this moment are, I talked a few years ago when I went on a sort of a mini pilgrimage, Epictetus informed pilgrimage. The, the image to, on the top is the theater in, uh, as it stands today in Hierapolis, and that is in Western Turkey. That's where Epictetus was born. And the, it's, it's a UNESCO heritage site. So as soon as the pandemic is over, I highly recommend going, going there. The image on the bottom, on the other hand, is the small theater, the Odeon in Nicopolis in Northwestern Greece. That's where Epictetus was sent into exile uh, after Domitian kicked out him and a bunch of other philosophers uh, in, uh, uh, in ancient Rome. And Epictetus went to Nicopolis and he reestablished his school, which became one of the most uh, famous and sought after school of the early part of the second century. Now, uh, many of you probably know this, but let me sort of refresh your memory about, about this stuff. There's, there's two major things that I wanna remind you about the Pictetus philosophy and approach to Stoicism. One is the so-called Stoic fork or dichotomy of control, which is not original to Epictetus. It's actually found much earlier in Stoicism, but Epictetus makes it a centerpiece of his philosophy. And as, as you know, it, it divides, famously divides these two things, right? The beginning of the Enchiridion, it divides everything into these two categories, things that are up to us and things that are not up to us. Sometimes people talk about things that we control, do not control, though that's a little bit misleading because control is, it's a little bit of a vague term or be, perhaps actually it's a little too strong of a term. I prefer the, the saying things up to us or not up to us. Now, what falls into each category? Well, the things that are up to us are pretty limited. They are setting our own priorities, um, our decisions to act or not to act in certain circumstances and, and our considered judgments. That's about it. Everything else falls into the things that are not really ultimately up to us, particularly our health, wealth, career, and reputation. Now we're in the middle of a pandemic, so health is on everybody's mind. Now you can apply the dichotomy control or the stoic fork to that particular situation, right? Ask yourself, okay, what is it that I can do about my health in the middle of a pandemic? Well, you can set your priorities straight. You can decide to do certain things or not to do certain things like wearing a mask or going to a party, uh, washing your hands and all that sort of stuff, right? And you can arrive at considered judgments about what the threat is about and how it works, et cetera. All of those things are in fact entirely up to you. Other people can influence you, but they are ultimately up to you. What you do not control is the outcome, right? Uh, you can do, you, you might do everything right and still get the virus, or you might do something wrong and not get the virus. The ultimate outcome is, of course, correlated with your actions, priorities, and judgments, but it doesn't, it doesn't depend on you. So this way of, so of organizing the world, essentially, it divides it into internal conscious thoughts, not all thoughts. Epictetus is obviously not saying that we control all our mental life. In fact, we don't control most of our mental life, but we do control our deliberate conscious decisions and judgments, and then everything else, which is external. And the external includes our, uh, our body, our own body, and our health. The other thing that we all know Epictetus is famous for are the three disciplines, uh, which Brian mentioned just a few minutes ago. Uh, these normally uh, are, it's, this is the way in which the, the uh, Stoic curriculum according to Epictetus is actually organized. Uh, the uh, book that I co-wrote with Greg Lopez, who asked the, the last question just a few minutes ago, uh, a handbook for new Stoics is in fact organized around the three disciplines. And the three disciplines are desire or more pre precisely desire and, and aversion. That's the stuff that tells you 
what priorities you should have and should not have in uh, in your life or things you should desire and, and or or have aversion to the discipline of action which deals with um, how to act in the world particularly with other people with respect to other people and then the discipline of assent which teaches you how to arrive at the best judgment possible and famously pierre Hado, uh linked these three disciplines to the three parts of the ancient early stoic curriculum the physics the logic and the ethics the physics is about natural science and metaphysics in other words it's about how the world works and it is how the world an understanding of how the world works that tells you what your priorities should be or should not be so what you should desire or not desire uh the discipline of, of action of course is connected with ethics ethics for the ancients was not just the study of right and wrong but the study of how to live your life literally and then ascent is connected with logic because it's about reasoning it's about sound sound reasoning now, in the book, I go through seven areas that I suggest uh, require some updates. Some of these updates are kind of some, somewhat minor tweaks and some are a little bit uh, larger, you know, broader. Some of them have uh, certain consequences. Others are sort of more limited. And the seven areas are externals don't need to be despised. Um, no need, there's no need to cultivate indifference for human, to human loss. Um, the issue about living according to nature there is some questionable science and metaphysics in the, in the Stoics in general, in particular in Epictetus. There is the issue of God or atoms that I'll get to in a minute. There is the fact that, of course, Epictetus wrote in the, uh, actually didn't write anything, but Arian, Epictetus student, wrote in the early part of the second century, which means that, of course, Epictetus teachings were situated culturally in a particular, uh, in a particular place and time and they don't necessarily directly translate to modern time. And then finally, there's this issue of social justice understood as the Stoics having a concept of justice as a virtue, but not having a concept necessarily of justice as a, as a broader, broader uh, sort of societal level. So these are the things that I think we need to, as a community, to talk about. So let me briefly go through each one of them and give you a general idea of, uh, of what the, the, the deal is. And then uh, there'll be hopefully a few minutes left for Q&A before we wrap up the evening. So number one, externals don't need to be despised. Now Epictetus, and in fact, even uh, occasionally Seneca, it encourages to despise externals, right? Because they get in the way of virtue. Epictetus is a little bit on the, on the almost on the... Uh, cynic fringe, you know, the cynic uh, range of the stoic uh, spectrum is really pretty strong about, about this, this kind of stuff, right? But that is, in fact, mostly a cynic attitude. It's the cynics who despise, literally despise uh, external stoics usually don't, right? Um, and one of the reasons we don't is because we think actually, as Seneca says explicitly, that, that externals are, some externals are in agreement with nature and others are against nature. And that's what makes the distinction between the so-called preferred and dispreferred indifference. Seneca tells us that uh, pleasure is in accordance with nature and that uh, pain is, uh, you know, in, uh, against nature. That doesn't turn us into Epicureans because we don't, we don't make uh, living a life without pain the top priority, but it is nevertheless the case that other things being equal, we should seek pleasure and avoid pain. Um, so the uh, contra Aristotle externals remain not necessary, therefore within the Stoic, uh, the Stoic approach, but only, only preferred, but they don't actually need to be despised. So some of the language that Epictetus uses is a little bit on the cynic side of things, and we don't need to uh, go for it. Similarly, uh, although for different reasons, we don't need to cultivate indifference to human loss. Now, Epictetus here it's, goes pretty strong, uh, again, again, stronger than, certainly than, than Seneca. He says, for example, that we should embrace the, you know, the, the fact that uh, we're gonna lose a loved one. He says, uh, you know, if your child dies or your, your wife dies, uh, you know, make sure that you know that this is a natural thing, therefore you're not gonna be disturbed. It's like, okay, sure. Um, the problem is that Epictetus derives this in a perfectly coherent fashion from the Stoic concept of providence, which I will get that, that to in a, in a little bit more detail in a minute. And it is the Stoic notion of providence that allows, uh, allows the ancient Stoics to not just endure certain things that would be difficult to endure for other people, but in fact, to even embrace them, right? Uh, because you're, whatever is happening is happening for the good of the universe. You know, Epictetus uses this famous, beautiful uh, analogy between uh, um, 
uh, the foot that steps into the mud and, uh, and the bad stuff that happens to us. He says, you know, if you're just a foot and you have to step into the mud, you're going to say, whoa, that's disgusting. I don't want to step into the mud. But if you realize that you're connected to a larger body and the body has to get home and in order to get home, it has to stop in, in step into the mud, then it's your role. And therefore, you shouldn't just do it, you know, uh, uh, because it's your, it's your duty. You should do it because it is the really good thing to do. You should be happy about it. That's the, the notion that... Um, Nietzsche, much later, not a Stoic, much later on uh, referred, to, referred to as Amor Fati, right? Love your faith. The problem is, many of us moderns don't have this luxury of believing in Stoic providence. Some of us apparently do. There are, there are some people, some modern Stoic practitioners who do. But I would wager that most of us don't. I certainly do not. And so uh, faith, in fact, turns out to be... Uh, something to be endured and not, and not really embraced. It's, Epictetus goes too far in that, in that perspective for good reasons at the time, but not for good reasons now. What about this business of living according to nature? Uh, well, nature for the Stoics uh, consisted in, uh, it was the cosmos itself, God and the cosmos and nature were the same thing. Uh, it, it was conceived as a living organism that participates in the logos, uh, that is the ability to be rational, the concept of rationality. The logos can be interpreted in a number of different ways, uh, but it's largely the, the, the notion that one can be rational, um, has a rational approach to things. But of course, modern, as modern scientists, as, as people that are informed by modern science, we actually think that um, things evolved according to uh, evolutionary theory in biology, and that therefore rationality is not a universal feature, no, it's not a feature of the universe as such. It is simply an evolved, something that evolved locally. It's a biological trait that evolved locally as a series of historical twists and turns may have evolved somewhere else in the cosmos. We don't know. Right now, we know that it only evolved on, on, on Earth in very specific circumstances. And so there is nothing inevitable or cosmic about it. Uh, so we still can live according to human nature in the sense that we, is the, the ancient Stoics were still correct that uh, human nature is largely the nature of a rational uh, animal uh, that uh, is also highly social. Uh, but that's about it. it there's no, there no con cosmic connection in that sense. Uh, to live at, according to nature, at a cosmic level, according to uh, Larry Baker, just means follow the facts, understand that the universe works in a certain way, and that therefore you shouldn't engage in, in uh, uh, wishful thinking, just you know, understand how the world works and act accordingly. Again, this has direct applications actually in the middle of a pandemic, right? Don't just wish magically that the virus would disappear. Uh, just act accordingly, according to the best understanding that we have of the science of viruses. Number four, uh, questionable science or metaphysics. There are, the ancient Stoics believed in a number of things that, of course, are not tenable today. For instance, uh, divination. There is a wonderful book that came out two or three years ago about divination in the ancient world and has an interesting chapter about the Stoics themselves. Now, for the Stoics, it, many people are surprised that, you know, what do you mean they lived in divination? I didn't think there was... Uh, um, uh, you know, that, that, that they, they believed in this kind of you know, essentially pseudoscience by modern standards. But from their perspective, this made perfect sense uh, because they believed in a universal web of cause and effect. And so the notion was that if everything is connected to everything else, then it stands to reason that you're going to look at one portion of the web of cause and effect and you're going to be deriving, uh, able to derive information about other portions of that web, including the future. This is really not, in principle, not different from the way science works, except that we don't look at the entrails of animals or the, the flight of eagles or things like that, right? So divination per se is not something that has to go. Uh, we also don't believe in a number of other notions that the ancient Stoics had, not particularly necessarily Epictetus, but for instance, the, the notion that the hegemonicon, our, our ruling faculty, as uh, Marcus Aurelius calls it, was actually located in the heart. Well, no. If it is anywhere, it's located in the brain. So that needs to be updated as well. As Gal Galen, uh, the um, personal physician of Marcus Aurelius, made fun of the Stoics precisely for that notion. He said, no, guys, it's not, it's not the heart, it's the brain. One of the major points here, the major, one of the major uh, things that I think need to go is this notion or needs to be revised is this notion of gods and items, right? Atoms. Um, 
There's a, this has been a surprising number of attempts, even by modern Stoics, to recover some sense, in some sense, the ancient concept of the universe of a universe God. It's just uh, it, because it's a beautiful idea, and I understand how people want to do that. But there is really no modern basis, in my opinion, in uh, in modern science for the idea that rationality is a characteristic of the universe, as opposed to individual living organisms within that universe. In fact, uh, Zeno um, at some point in, uh, is reported to have said. Um, to have argued about um, for, for this notion that the universe is rational because it contains rational uh, organisms. This is in Cicero's uh, On the Nature of the, of the Gods. And that is essentially philosophy known now as a, a fallacy of composition. You cannot go from the attributes of parts of a system to the attributes of an entire system or vice versa. So Cleantus, Chrysippus, and Epictetus, why, why did they think all of this stuff? Well, they, they think about, about it this way, about the cosmos this way, because they essentially propose an argument from design. Um, Epictetus does so in the discourses, and I discussed that actually in a chapter of How to Be a Stoic, the, the first book that I published on Stoicism. Cleantus and Chrysippus also use very clearly an argument from design. Again, it's this, it, the details, you'll find the details in, uh, in Cicero. Well, fact is, today, the argument from design is not acceptable anymore. After David Hume in the 18th century and Charles Darwin in the 19th century, uh, the, the argument from design it needs to be put to rest. Hume uh, famously provided a very good philosophical counter-argument, and then Darwin proposed, the, for the first time, alternative mechanism for the appearance of design in, in nature. And so when Epictetus asks, uh, ask us to consider the fact that the universe seems to be made like a like a sword that fits the scabbard. Um, well, it turns out that it isn't. Uh, and the answer for why certain structures in the universe, like the human eye, for instance, or the heart, or something like that, seem to 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 be designed, is because there is a process called natural selection, which was discovered uh, by Darwin and Wallace in the uh, 19th century. Now, Marcus Aurelius, as you probably know. Uh, himself actually several times in the meditations uh, considers these, these two possibilities, the gods, the famous God or Adam's stuff. Now it's clear to me or that Marcus Aurelius accepts the, the stoic metaphysics, so the God stuff, not the Adam stuff. The Adam stuff, of course, is the alternative, is the, the proposal that at the time was made by the Epicureans, that it's all Adam's bumping in the void. So I'm not suggesting that Marcus Aurelius was an agnostic about this question. It, was, it clearly wasn't. However, several times in the meditations, when he uh, considers it, he says, well, okay, either one or the other, uh, but no matter what, I still have to get up in the morning and do my job as a human being. I still need to act virtuously and so on and so forth. So he, he himself didn't seem to see a particularly close, tight connection there uh, between uh, uh, this notion of these metaphysical notions and the ethics that uh, follows from them. Number six, uh, so local customs are neither universal nor immutable. The Stoics, as I mentioned before, were of course people of their time, right? So even though they were in several, in, in several respects far ahead of many other people and even philosophers of their time, for instance, uh, they explicitly say that women are just as intellectually endowed as men. Uh, uh, Epictetus says so, Seneca uh, says so very clearly in his letter to Marcia, for instance. Right? But at the same time, they endorse a number of social customs, like for instance, for the Roman Stoics, sex only for procreation within marriage. That's, you find that both in Seneca and in Epictetus. Uh, that really no longer makes sense to us, and, and they don't need to be followed just because, again, Epictetus says so. Right? And also, if you read Epictetus and Seneca in particular, there are some bits that are just positively cringeworthy by our standards, right? Especially when they talk about women, even though they, they agree that women are uh, just as endowed intellectually, even so, uh, Seneca especially and from time to time goes on and says, you know, don't be a womanly, don't be like a woman, etc., etc. Now, there is a number of modern authors that, have, that are interested in Stoicism and updating Stoicism, uh, two of them that I highly recommend reading, Scott Aiken and Emily McGill Rutherford, who have actually uh, done a very interesting analysis of uh, the kinds of modern positions that are, are logically entailed by, by uh, Stoic philosophy or not. And they say that even though, of course, the ancient Stoics themselves were nothing like, you know, feminist in the modern sense of the world, the word, 
uh, they suggest and they make a very good argument that actually stoicism as a philosophy of life does entail feminism. Feminism understood at a minim, as in a minimal minimalist way as simply the notion that we, women are endowed with the same ability to reason and therefore they should be treated accordingly uh, as, as men. And then finally, justice at a, as a, at a societal level. Um, the ancient Stoics, of course, uh, had again something very interesting to say. Uh, several of them um, were wrote again, against slavery. Uh, apparently Zeno of Sardium said that slavery is evil. Um, several um, um, ancient Stoics did fight against tyranny. Um, the, look at, for instance, the number of philosophers and uh, senators that fall into the general uh, category of the Stoic opposition. Both, both Don and I have written essays about, about that. And there were, of course, cosmopolitan, as we've heard um, Brian explain tonight. Nevertheless, for all these positives, they did not have a concept of justice at a societal as, a, as distinct from a individual level. And we do need that sort of concept. We, we need to uh, function in a society, not just as individuals. So uh, again, accordingly, a number of modern authors, including Larry Baker, Chris Gale, Gabriele Galuzzo, Kai Whiting, these are, they've been looking at different aspects of this issue. And for instance, they've been making interesting proposals about uh, you know, uh, social justice, environmentalism in particular. Obviously the ancient Stoics didn't talk about environmentalism. They were not concerned about the environment, with the environment. But as modern Stoics, we should be not just as human beings, but also as Stoics, because there are, there are connections, there are things that are implied by Stoic philosophy that are in fact um, pertinent to these kinds of subject matters. So, Stoicism has always been, and it will continue to be, uh, so long as it will exist as a philosophy, uh, it uh, uh, is a living, evolving, ethical, and, and, and practical philosophy of life. And it is up to us as a community of Stoic practitioners to have these conversations on, on, on and off and see what is it that needs to be changed and, and altered, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Questions at some point will arise about, you know, well, but if you change, if you keep changing it, is the stoicism ultimately it doesn't really matter. But if your ideas are in fact inspired by the ancient Stoics and they can be uh, traced and connected to a long tradition of thought in stoicism, then then they are stoic, um, and not much hinges really on labels anyway. Um, lots of people, as I said, have been in the business of changing stoicism ever from the beginning. The guy on the upper left there is. Um, um, obviously uh, Zeno of Citium, and then you got Epictetus uh, right next to him, and you recognize presumably a lot of these, uh, of these faces. All of these are people both in ancient and modern times that have actually have through their scholarship, through their writings, through their uh, you know, acting in life, uh, updated uh, stoicism. So that's what I wanted to say about uh, my little new contribution to the uh, modern stoic um, Laura, and let's see if I can um, stop sharing and come back to a discussion. So let's see if there are, I see that there are people up with their hand. We have a few minutes. So Pedro, you are first. Oh, hi, Massimo. Hi. Yeah, so my question was, since you mentioned in that in uh, stories, you, you have a lot of conversation regarding the metaphysical part, right? Yes. But can you still continue on with the ethical part, even though, and not focus as much? Because I know in the meditations, Marcus Aurelius mentioned the gods, you know, always you know, something happened, all me, as you mentioned, predestined by the gods. Yeah. So can you feel, or does that, do, they both do not have to be together, right? Right, so, so to some extent, yes, I guess the, my answer is gonna be yes and no. Um, and, and here's how it works in my mind. I still do agree with the ancient Stoics that there are connections between the physics, the logic and the ethics. I don't think we can do just with the ethics. There, there is some people in modern Stoicism that do try to say, no, no, we need to be concerned just with the ethics. And in fact, some of the ancient Stoics said the same thing. But no, I think that the, the general notion that uh, you cannot live a good life, which means the ethics, unless you reason correctly about things, and, um, and that's the logic, and unless you have a, some level of understanding of how the world actually works, as opposed to you know, the way other people want, wanted to work or the way your visual thinking wanted to work, uh, then I still think that there are connections. But what I'm suggesting is that those connections are not rigid. Uh, 
that is, there is more than one way to cash out the connections between the ethics, the logic, and, and, uh, and the metaphysics, such that you can tweak a little bit uh, the metaphysics, for instance, and, you know, do away with certain parts and replace them with modern equivalents without actually losing much um, or, or altering too much the, the ethics. In a sense, this is the same stuff, again, that the ancient Stoics were doing. Um, when Zeno started out teaching his philosophy, Stoicism was arguably a very syncretic uh, philosophy, meaning that, that he borrowed from all over, right and left, because he had been studying for more than 10 years with different philosophers in Athens. And it was Chrysippus, you know, uh, two generations of Stoic uh, leaders later, uh, that, um, that kind of systematized the whole thing and made things a little bit more coherent, to, took out certain things, the reinterpreted other things. That's why Diogenes Laertius tells us that if it were not for Chrysippus, there would be no store. But, this, but the process didn't stop there. So the, the, what I'm suggesting here is that um, the connections between the three parts are there, but they're not rigid. And so we can tweak, we can do things, change things, even drop things, so long as we're careful that when we do it, we actually are mindful of what kind of consequences come out of it, and then we deal with those consequences. As I said, uh, in the case, if you drop the, the, the notion of the living organism, the, the cosmos as a living organism, you lose the, the, the notion of providence. If you lose the notion of providence, that does have effects on the ethics because it means that at best you can embrace, uh, you can, sorry, you can endure, uh, you know, certain things in life, but definitely not embrace them. You can, you're not going to go for Amor Fati at that point. Uh, Mark, you're next. Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Sure, yes. I think you may have just answered my question, but my question was, while I agree with you on evolving Stoicism, um, on Amor Fati, I understand that fate does not need to be embraced, but could you explain what you mean by it cannot reasonably be embraced? For example, in the analogy of the dog tied to a cart, can't we as the dog decide to happily run with the cart instead of just accepting our lack of choice? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Yes, of course. In the case of the, of the, at that level of analysis, yes, I agree. Uh, you can decide, yeah, you know, this is the way things work. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna simply, uh, change the way I look at things so that I can, uh, I can not only deal with it, but embrace it. But there are other situations like, you know, your child dying, where that kind of mind trick becomes a little more difficult for a modern to pull off, right? And, and so I, in a sense, I'm with Seneca, where he says in uh, one of the letters to Lucilius, uh, sorry, uh, in, in the letters to Marsha, he says, you know, of course you grieve, that's a human thing. Right, but technically, gr uh, grief is a unhealthy emotion. It's a, it's a it's a passion, and so the ancient Stoics would say, no, you really should work toward not feeling it at all. Seneca is more humane and says, of course you're going to feel it. Um, and in fact, he also writes about grief to to Lucilius, and he says, you know, I don't I don't want you to become, uh, you know, an unfeeling human being. That's just not being human. However, you do need to understand rationally what's going on, to accept it, and then to move on, right? So I think that's a, a healthy perspective that still comes out of Stoicism, but it's not quite going so far as, you know, loving the fact that you just lost a child or something like that. Um, we got a few more minutes. So, Michael. Yeah, thanks, Massimo. Um, so you mentioned it doesn't really matter so much what we uh, the label of Stoicism, but uh, so you kind of anticipated my question a little bit. So I want to elaborate on this. How, how much can you change Stoicism before it's no longer Stoicism? Are there no boundaries around it? Um, and if the label doesn't matter, why call what you're proposing Stoicism? Why not call it Massimoism? Um, and there has been policing of the practice by prominent Stoics about whether or not a certain public figure is stoic or not. Right. Um, and so if, if the labels don't matter, why is that kind of thing happening within the larger stoic community? Right, yeah, that's a great question, thank you. Um, again, the answer I think, uh, if you allow me, is gonna be yes and no, M meaning that, uh, first of all, Zeus forbid that somebody starts going around talking about masomism or something like that. Uh, let, let's stick with stoicism. But, um, Yes and no in this sense. So I believe that, that any complex concept, such as the concept of a philosophy of life, is inherently fuzzy. 
Um, it's a, it, uh, in, in that sense, I agree with Wittgenstein that every complex uh, concept is fuzzy. It, that there's no set of, uh, there's no small set of necessary and sufficient conditions that allow you to define stoicism, okay? That doesn't mean, however, that everything goes. And that's why I, I say that we need to negotiate this as a community. I mean, even in ancient stoicism, that was the, the, the same thing. When some people at some point said, you know what, forget it. Uh, I don't want to do anything to do with uh, the physics or the logic. I'm just going to do ethics. Then those people themselves actually left the store. Uh, they, they say, okay, well, this is not, no longer stoicism, right? So I think that there are boundaries, but those boundaries are... are um, fuzzy and to some extent they are negotiable and i'm sure i'm going to have different ideas from don or from brian or from uh chris gill or from you uh about where that boundary actually is and that's why it needs to be a conversation right so uh, so i on the one hand i agree that there are certain, you cannot push this too much because otherwise beyond a certain limit it really doesn't make a hell of a sense to, to talk about stoicism um but at the same time, we also don't want to be too rigid and say, no, unless it's in Epictetus or Seneca or Marcus Aurelius, it's not Stoicism, because that is, that's, I've seen that attitude, and it's, I, I think that's a little too rigid. Uh, Phil. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes. We're good? Perfect. Oh, super. Uh, you know, I've come across the line again and again, there are no sages in Stoicism. Mm -hmm. So how do we decide at the end of the day, what is Stoicism and what is not? Who's to tell us except ourselves? Well, uh, you got the answer right there. It is ourselves, right? So there are no sages, at least I don't know any sage uh, walking around. Uh, Seneca famously says that the sage is as rare as the phoenix. The, the mythological bird that rises from its ashes. And according to Roman mythology, the, the phoenix rises every 500 years. So, you know, there's not a lot of sages out there. Um, now, it is up to us. It is, it is and in fact, again, I, uh, the, the 20th century philosopher uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein would agree that this, we're, we're playing in a sense, as in, to use his words, a, a, um, a game, uh, a, a word game of some sort. And we have to agree as a community. If we use the, the terms in a certain way, then that is what counts as stoicism. And if we stop using the terms in a certain way, then it's then is no longer stoicism. Uh, this is not to say, however, that there are no constraints, right? I mean, after all, stoicism isn't something that we invented in the 21st century. Uh, just a few minutes ago, uh, it is something that has a long tradition and goes up, goes all the way back 23 centuries. And so uh, we want to to maintain some kind of continuity with that tradition. But this is not a problem just for Stoicism, right? It's, it's the same thing as happened for every other philosophy or religion or life. I mean, look at Buddhism. There are There are many, many different schools of Buddhism. Larry Baker pointed out something interesting, something I think insightful. He said uh, in, in A New Stoi Stoicism, he said, look, uh, the reason it may sound bizarre to talk about updating, update, updating Stoicism and, you know, and, and, and uh, changing things is because Stoi Stoic tradition has been interrupted. Right? After the first five centuries, uh, pretty much between the second and third century, uh, there was no Stoicism anymore as a school of thought. Right? There was Christianity, that was it. And uh, people kept being influenced by, influenced by Stoicism, including a lot of Christian uh, uh, you know, founding, you know, fathers and, and theologians, and then early modern philosophers from Descartes to Spinoza. But there was no Stoic school as a movement until the late 20th century, until people like Dunn and, and, uh, and Chris and John Sellers uh, and in France, Pierre Hadot started doing this kind of stuff, right? So there is a gap. And so the reason we might feel artificial and might feel bizarre to talk about modifying and updating stories is because there is that gap. But if we were talking about Buddhism, on the other hand, uh, these modifications would have happened organically over the last 2000 years. And we probably would be looking today at several different schools of stoicism, just as we look at several different schools of um, uh, of Buddhism. And uh, it is about eight o'clock. So I know that there are a few more people uh, with their hands raised, but I want to close on, on time for uh, with, you know, respecting your time and the, the other speakers. Thank you so much, uh, everyone, for coming uh, tonight. Thanks, Brian, uh, and thanks, Don, for uh, lending uh, us our, their, their, their scholarship and their wisdom. And hopefully we all learn something tonight. And um, have a good night and uh, hopefully we'll see you next year in person, uh, you know, COVID permitting. <laughs> Stay safe.
Take care, everyone. Bye, everyone.